Okay, let's get started. Um, thank you everyone for, for coming. Uh, it is my, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Kelly Condit. Kelly is visiting us from the um, University of Washington in Seattle, where she's an assistant professor. Um, Kelly got her uh, undergraduate degree as her BA in uh, geology in, uh, in Middlebury College in 2017. No, in 20, uh, 2011. 2011. All right. So, my time is clearly Never mind. Let me get all my stuff in here. Yeah. Okay. So, 2011. Um, and then she moved to the University of, uh, of Colorado in Boulder, where she got her, uh, her PhD working with uh, Kevin Meehan. Uh, in you know deformation uh, mechanisms and shear zones in lower crust and you know kind of the petrology and rheology of, of lower crustal deformation. Uh, and after that, she moved to uh, Rice uh, University as the vice uh, postdoctoral fellow, where she worked with uh, Melody French and, and Cynthia Lee. Then after that, um, she was awarded an uh, NSF postdoctoral fellowship, and she moved to MIT to work with uh, Mate uh, Peck. Uh, she was there from uh, 2018 to uh, 2019, and I learned a couple days ago that well, while she was there, she shared an office uh, with uh, with her bay. Uh, so we'll go back to, to the MIT days. Um, and then in 2020, she moved to to U University of Washington in Seattle, where she's been an assistant professor for the last uh, uh, couple of years. So just slightly, you know, surely predating, you know, kind of the start of, of COVID. Barely, yeah. Barely. Um, so the, the reason why I uh, wanted to uh, uh, have Kaylee uh, over is because I find her research super interesting and it intersects a lot of the things that we think about in the department. And it's a, it's a very interesting mixture of metamorphic petrology and understanding you know, metamorphic processes and recrystallization and deformation, rock rheology, so how rocks and minerals deform and what we can learn about you know, kind of the metamorphic transformations and deformation in the deep lithosphere. And what the implications of you know these metamorphic recrystallization and deformation are for um, for uh, geophysical processes, so for you know earthquakes and seismic anisotropy in the crust and, and things like that, how different minerals uh, absorb uh, deformation and uh, accommodate deformation in the in the lower lithosphere, um, and also all the you know the implications that this has for for deformation at, at convergent boundaries and, and subduction zones. Um, so her talk today is about the uh, geology, petrology, and rheology of uh, deep flow slip in, in subduction zones. And with that, I'll maybe take it away. Thank you. Um, did you do the thing you needed to do on the Zoom? Yeah, so it should okay, be recording. Yes, your screen sharing right, and recording. Yeah, uh, okay, well, Mauricio, thank you so much for inviting me. And I had a really lovely time meeting with a lot of you today. Um, it's been really great. This is my first in-person talk visit since the pandemic began. So uh, it's just been so nice to actually see humans in three dimensions and talk about science. So thank you for being so welcoming to me. Um, before I get into some of my science, I want to just acknowledge my co-authors on this work, particularly Melody French, who has really been a partner in crime in a lot of the rheology aspects of this work. And then Victor Guevara, who has been uh, really helpful with a lot of the petrologic modeling uh, presented in this work today. Um, and then you'll also notice Jonathan Delft, who is a graduate of UVA. Um, he's also someone that I worked with at Rice and have collaborated with. Um, okay, so uh, quickly, I wanna just spend a couple of moments before we dig into subduction zones, talking about some of the work I've been doing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I noticed last year that a lot of the speakers of color that were coming into the University of Washington were presenting a lot on the UVI work that they were doing. And that's awesome. But as a white person, I felt like it was my responsibility to also be doing a lot of this work. And in fact, I think a lot of the uh, heavy lifting that needs to be done in our community needs to be done by the majority of our community, which is white, to make our community more diverse and have uh, more equity centered within it. So some of the things that I have been doing is working with this program called Recess, which is um, research experience and solid earth science for students. It's an undergraduate program. It's run through UMASCO in Boulder, Colorado. I've been working with them since 2012. Um, it's a summer 11 week long research program. It's similar to an REU, but it is really uh, research intensive. The students go 
present their work that they do in this 11 week long program at AU or DSA or SACNAS. And um, they also get a lot of mentorship, and more mentorship than most students get during an REU. And they get career mentorship and communication mentorship, and they actually get longitudinal mentorship throughout sort of their whole journey um, into or out of academia. Um, and they target specifically undergraduates from underrepresented groups. So this could be BIPOC scientists, this could be veterans, non-traditional scientists, any way that you can articulate that you are an undergraduate student that is from an underrepresented group in the geosciences, this program is for you. So if you are one of those students, you should look at recess and think about applying for it. There is a stipend, so you actually make money, you're not losing money during this um, program. And if you have undergraduate students that are excited and motivated about science, you should direct them in this uh, direction towards recess. You can see the website there. And I'm really happy to report that while this program is usually both based in Boulder, we're actually hosting a satellite uh, pilot study of recess in the summer of 2022, this summer at UW. So just be aware of that program. Um, I also designed and built uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series at the University of Washington in our department. And so this is where we take about a third of our colloquia like this, and we invite early career BIPOC and LGBTQ plus speakers to come talk to us. We do this to build relationships with diverse scientists. It's great to feature this wide range of identities within our speakers. Um, we have mentoring for leadership lunch series, so our graduate students and postdocs can talk to these early career um, faculty from diverse backgrounds. And then we also compensate our speakers with an honorarium. Um, so this is an awesome tool that we've been using to make our community more diverse. Um, I've also been part of founding this uh, community called Petronet, which is an inclusive and anti-racist lactate community for pathologists and high-temperature geochemists. So if you are one of those, you should join us. You can go to pathologynetwork.org and join us. It's an affinity group which we are using to build create uh, to build community and create safe spaces and share resources. Um, so happy to talk more about Petronet if you're interested. But we have about 75 members right now, and we're looking to grow. So if you're interested, come join us. And then lastly, in my own lab group, I build equity into our culture, our group culture. So we read DEI papers for about a third of our group meetings. We really value. DEI work, and I encourage and reward it in my students because I really view that it is not extra work, it's a vital part of our job. Um, so with that, I'm happy to talk about any of these things further if anyone interested, um, but I'll get into some of the subduction zone science that I've been working on. So we're all familiar with this kind of cartoon, right, subduction zones, where we have an oceanic plate that's subducting over and under some uh, overriding plate, and these zones host the most devastating volcanic eruptions on Earth. And they also have the largest earthquakes on Earth. So there's these huge geologic hazards that are part of subduction zones. And I'm going to argue, <laughs> as someone who works on the plate boundary, that the processes happening on the plate boundary are really influencing both of these two geologic hazards. So when we think about the chemical evolution of this plate interface, that's influencing element cycling and what materials are making it down into Arctic regions. And then we think about the way the rocks along this plate interface are flowing or breaking, that's obviously influencing these fault zones as well. So if we look at a cartoon in a little bit more detail, actually to scale, we can look at this similar you know, subduction zone. We know from the rock record and from geophysical observations that the plate interface here is really fluid rich. So there seems to be, maybe not always, but maybe always, three fluids that are along the whole plate interface in the subduction zone. So this is really interesting. From the rock record, we also know that the plate interface is really lithologically diverse. So there's a lot of different rock types here. And this will come back as sort of a theme of a lot of this talk, but we know at shallow depths, this plate interface is a thin tabular fault zone. And then at deeper depths, it transitions into a shear zone like this, which you can see is really lithologically diverse here. And while often on cartoons, the plate interface is drawn as a line, this is a zone of deformation that has some absolute thickness. And that's important. And so these fluids along the plate interface are facilitating and influencing the chemical and mechanical processes that are happening here. And so when we think about the chemical transformations that happen along the plate interface, we know that we have a lot of water bearing minerals here. So minerals that have water in their crystalline structure. Um, we have a lot of metamorphic reactions that are happening along the plate interface along in here. We see evidence for chemical alteration or a process called metasomatism. And as this oceanic lithosphere subducts 
it heats up as it descends into the mantle. And we lose some of those mineral bound uh, water groups here when those hydrous minerals break down. And so it releases those water as volatiles. And then if we think about how this plate boundary is flowing or breaking, we know at shallow depths here, we have the seismogenic zone and it goes nominally locked and then releases energy in catastrophic megathrust earthquakes. And then down to of this, we transition into ductile deformation, where we have continuous viscous deformation that's accommodating all of the offset between the subducting plate and the overriding plate. And so one thing that many people in our community have gotten really interested in is something that's happening actually sort of right at the uh, interface between the lost seismogenic zone and this transition to ductile deformation. And that is something that's called slow slip or slow earthquake, or if you have this slow slip occurring with tremor and occurring episodically, it's called episodic tremor and slip or EPS. So there's a lot of nomenclature involved with this. Um, so when I'm talking about slow slip, I'm typically focusing on slow slip that's also happening when we have non-volcanic tremor here. And this has been recognized specifically through geodetic data and through seismic data um, to occur down dip of the seismogenic zone in some subduction zones. Um, you know, between depths of maybe 25 and 65 kilometers. And people have gotten really interested in it because it's cool to find out a new slip behavior that's also doing. Um, we didn't know this really was happening until about uh, the turn of this century. So like maybe 1999 is when we first recognized this. Um, but also these, these slow slip events are potentially accommodating quite a bit of deformation and part of the slip budget in the subduction zone. And we don't quite understand how they fold into the broader um, subduction zone slip budget. So when we think about episodic tremor and slip, here is just a cartoon of uh, my favorite subduction zone, Cascadia, here. And you can see here Seattle, here is the Juan de Fuca plate subducting underneath the North American plate. And this is the zone where we have episodic tremor and slip down here at this transition between the lock seismogenic zone and where we have ductile breach. And so ETS consists of cyclical slow slip events. So these have recurrence intervals on the order of months to years. And individual subduction zones that experience ETS have different recurrence intervals. Um, and even different segments of the same subduction zone that have ETS have different uh, recurrence intervals. So they're episodic in nature, roughly. And they can, con they can occur over weeks to months. Um, so that's why they're often called slow earthquakes. And they can release as much energy as a magnitude six to seven and a half. So they're releasing a lot of energy um, from the system. So if this was happening quickly, like an earthquake, it would be a large earthquake, not quite you know, a catastrophic megathrust, but still a large one. Um, we know the slip rates here are faster than tectonic creeping rates, but slower than earthquake slip rates. Um, and they seem to be temporally and spatially coincident with something called tremor or non-volcanic tremor. And we think that these are occurring along the plate interface. Uh, these slow slip events have been largely identified geodetically um, for CDS measurements. And non volcanic tremor, sort of the T part of ETS, we think are a series of low frequency earthquakes. And the intensity of tremor appears to be proportional to the amount of slow slip that's happening. So there is a mechanistic link between slow slip and tremor when we have ETS in this series. So here are some examples of where we have observed slow slip. This is from a paper from 2011. So this has evolved a little bit, but we don't see ETS in all subduction zones, but we do tend to see it in subduction zones that are warm. So that suggests there's some thermally mediated process that is part of ETS. Um, so here are some of the subduction zones where we see uh, slow slip happening. And this is sort of the spatial uh, occurrence of slow slip. So you can look here, for example, in Alaska, you can see these are the plate boundaries. These are the subducting plate contours here. And in green, we're looking at where the slow slip events are. And in red, we're looking where the tremor is occurring. And you can see it's down dip of this patch that ruptured in the giant 1964 earthquake. We see a similar pattern in Nankai in southern Japan, where we have uh, slow slip and tremor coincident with each other spatially here, all down dip of these patches that uh, ruptured in um, the early part of the 20th century. And then again, my favorite subduction zone, Cascadia, you can see here we have tremor and slow slip happening along here. And we don't, <laughs> we don't have a ruptured zone here because we haven't had a large megathrust earthquake there since um, 1703. So we're due, which is great. We're there. Um, <laughs> so this is 
where this is all happening. And as I said, you know, these deep slow slope events have preceded large megathrust earthquakes um, before, and they are definitely contributing to the subductions of the slip budget, but we're not really sure how. And part of the reason why we're not really sure how is because we still don't know really what mechanisms are responsible for slow slope interrupts. We've observed them geophysically, but we don't actually mechanistically know what's happening. Um, geophysical observations, I think, are like one of the key factors that a lot of the people working from the rock record on ETS need to like keep as closely um, in mind as possible when we're looking for what ETS might be. Um, so what do we know from geophysical observations? Well, we know that where ETS is occurring is a fluid-rich environment because we see these low shear wave velocities, um, high DTBS ratios, um, suggesting that there's a lot of fluids there. And people have observed tid tidal triggering of slope of events. So that means that a couple of kilopascal change in the stress regime of these faults is triggering these slope of events. So a couple of kilopascals is really small, right? I think it's even less than that. Um, they're very small like uh, changes in um, the stress regime here that's triggering them. So those two things together have suggested that this is an area of elevated pore fluid pressures because we're sort of reducing that effective normal stress through those high pore fluid pressures. So you don't need a high change in the stress regime to trigger one of these slopes of events. And as I said before, they appear to occur in warm subduction zones. So if we return to this diagram here, you can see I've suggested that this is a zone of high pore fluid pressures here. This is sort of the area that we're looking in. And as I said, we don't know really actually what the mechanisms for ETS are, which makes it hard if we don't know what's causing ETS to fold it into our model for subduction zones. So some workers from the rock record have suggested that it's a mix of brittle viscous deformation. So here's an example from the Mugi Melange in Japan of a melange foliation that people have suggested um, was deforming and accommodating those slow slip strain rates. And then they see these fractures here and they say these shear fractures are low frequency earthquake sources. So, you know, you have some mixed brittle viscous deformation and this is accommodating slow slip. And, um, you know, these fractures are happening because they're basically hydrofractures. So the rock is, has such high pore fluid pressures that it's rigid. And so people have suggested this is a source for slow slip. Other workers have suggested that uh, we were actually activating frictional deformation mechanisms below the brittle ductal transition zone through this elevated pore fluid pressure. And so if we have velocity strengthening materials here, um, that can basically be a self-arresting mechanism for uh, these slow slip strains. So if we have these high pore fluid pressures that are activating some frictional deformation, um, rather than allowing them to run away into a large earthquake because they're velocity strengthening, they're actually going to self-arrest. And so some workers have suggested that, you know, blocks of rigid material inside these foliated um, velocity strengthening materials may fracture to form the low frequency earthquakes and that the slow slip is accommodated by this frictional mechanism. So in both of these cases, aqueous fluids are vital or important in these mechanisms. So fluids are important. So, you know, I've sort of thought about just following the fluids and seeing what they can tell us. Um, a lot of people go out and they see rocks that are broken and they see rocks that have some viscous features and they say, aha, we know slow slip has some, you know, component of slip and some component of breaking, so this must be slow slip. Um, I've taken a sort of different perspective, which is trying to look at what the rock record can actually tell us, the rocks can actually, what kind of deformation they can accommodate by combining the observations I see and how they're deforming with our understanding of constitutive relations or flow laws for the way these rocks are deforming. And then I've also brought in some petrologic modeling to look at how fluids may be uh, behaving or sourced from. So I'm sort of looking at what the um, environment of slow slip looks like, looks like, and then using that environment to preclude or include potential mechanisms for slow slip events. So uh, first we're gonna go to the rock record and I'm gonna show you some of the work I've been doing there. So in my work, I go to exempt blocks of deep crust and I use them as a natural laboratory to reconstruct what was happening in the past in say a subduction zone to relate it to what might be happening in say a Mugi Cascadia right now. 
So this is the Upper Engadine Valley in Switzerland. It's a beautiful place to do field work. This is where I went during my postdoc, right? But we're also actually standing in an exhumed subduction interface. So we're standing in an exhumed subduction interface right here, across the Engadine line right here. This fixed, oh, you can see the subduction interface is uh, continuing over here. And this is that overriding plate right here. So the subduction interface is right in here. And so this subduction interface is part of the Alps. It's called the Arosa zone or sometimes the Plata map. It's in central Switzerland, or, or sorry, it's the central Alps. So it's in Eastern Switzerland right here. This represents the Cretaceous to Paleogene plate boundary. And so I outlined the plate boundary with this dashed line here. And so these gray rocks here, this is the overriding plate. Um, this is part of the Astro-Alpine plate. Um, and then these teal rocks here, this is the subduction interface terrain. So this is sort of the preservation of that subduction interface shear zone here. And this subduction zone forms during the closure of the Painting Ocean between the European and Asiatic plates uh, before the Alpine Orogeny. So this is a nice place to work because we have this uh, framework that's already been created for the geology of this area where we sort of know the PT conditions along this plate interface during subduction. And so the exposure depth here deepens from the north to the south. And so we're deepening from pretty shallow uh, paleo depths of about 10 kilometers up here in the north to quite deep uh, paleo depths of maybe 35 to more like 40 kilometers down here in the south. And importantly, fossil earthquakes or something called pseudocatholite, which are frictional melts that form during earthquakes, have been preserved in the overriding plate within about um, 10 meters of this contact here between 200 and 300 degrees C. So this zone in here has been conferred to be an ancient subduction seismogenic zone. And if you remember from what I was introducing earlier, we see slow slip down dip of the subduction zone in uh, the currently deforming subduction zone. And so we went and targeted these rocks down here in this area and the deep part of the Arosa zone to see what those rocks are telling us about the environment during subduction. So, um, I'm going to introduce some of the geology that I actually did there, and then I'm going to get quickly into one specific sample that I think is a good barometer in some ways of the conditions there. So we went to two different sites down dip of this uh, seismogenic zone. And so here you can see a simplified geologic map of part of the area of this site one. Um, we're at conditions here during subduction of between 300 and 400 degrees C, and we're at paleo depths of maybe 30 kilometers. And the plate interface here is this 400 meter thick body. It has tabular layers of a lot of different lithologies, including serpentinite, metasedimentary rocks. There's a bunch of mafic schists and metabasalt and tal schists here. And then if we look at site two, this is at slightly warmer temperatures, similar depths here. Um, these are just cross sections through these mapped areas. In this area, the rocks are, uh, the plate interface is about 500 meters thick, and we have tabular layers of serpentinite, metasedimentary rocks. We also have mafic schists that are wrapping around these metabasalts um, and tall schists, and there's a lot of evidence in both of these areas for metasomatism or fluid mediated um, chemical transformation um, and changes in bulk rock composition. So I went into this area and specifically targeted some of these metasedimentary rocks. I targeted these metasedimentary rocks because one, we know a lot, at least from the rheological perspective, <laughs> relatively, about how strong or weak these minerals in these rocks might be. Um, and also because metasedimentary rocks have been invoked as a potential mechanism that can weaken the plate interface. I actually just talked to the people about this a little bit earlier today. Um, so this is what this looks like in the field. This is uh, taken from site one. You can see it's obviously a beautiful place to do work, um, but it's also <laughs> lithologically a bit of a mess, right? So we have this Austro-Alpine plate. Here's the, where the sort of trace of that contact is right here. We have serpentinite in this gully. There's talc schist that just gets eroded away really easily. We've got some mica schists, and this is actually a rock that I'm going to talk to you about a lot more. We have some calcareous schists and some metabasalt. So they're really lithologically diverse zones. And if we look at some of these rocks, we can see that there are uh, a lot of things that are happening with fluid um, within these rocks. And so we see a lot of features of fluid-mediated processes. So here is a massive metabasalt, and it's got these 
and generation of epidote veins right here horizontally. And then you can see these epidote veins are crosscut by these port stains. So this is suggesting that this rock um, was deforming brittily or was fracturing, right? And there are some fluids that moved into those fractures and precipitated minerals. We can contrast that with what, say, this metasedimentary rock looks like, right? Where we have this foliated talc schist, and it has these foliation parallel quartz and calcite veins that have been rotated and recrystallized during deformation. So this tells us that these veins happened before or during ductile deformation, and then were recrystallized and rotated um, as this uh, viscous foliation developed. Okay, so I mentioned this mica schist, and we're gonna zoom into it and talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, this is Melody French here for scale. Um, this day, you can imagine it was cold. There's snow around. This was in September. Um, so we go over to this big serpentinite block because it was just radiating heat in the sun. It's like keep warm and just like run back and like look at these rocks some more. Um, but this is a foliated politic schist and it's riddled with quartz, quartz crack seal veins. So you can see here that trace of the foliation and then it has all of these beautiful quartz crack seal veins. And so these veins form from fracturing and then they have um, a fluid that precipitates material into the veins. So here is what the microstructures look like in here. So, you know, I do a lot of work looking at the microstructures to see mechanistically what exactly is happening within these rocks and what processes can they preserve. So here is a full conception photo micrograph of what this rock sort of looks like right here. We can see that there are these blocky elongate quartz veins that are cross-cutting this viscous uh, foliation here. And uh, if we look at the mineral assemblage that defines this foliation, we have a lot of quartz, we have fengite, which is a white mica, we have albite, we have actinolite, we have a nasty mineral called cyclomeline that I thought was biotite for a while, but it is cyclomeline. Um, and then there's some other accessory minerals. Um, but based on silica and fengite um, compositions and some pre existing temperature data, we think that this rock was deforming because it has this, you know, mineral assemblage that's defining the foliation, was deforming at about conditions of 300 degrees and pressures of 0.9 GPA in here. So this is during subduction, right? We're seeing foliation that's developing during subduction. So what I wanted to do is say, okay, if we see this foliation is developing during subduction, how strong was this foliation? And could this viscous foliation that we see preserved here potentially be forming during the flow phase event, right? That's what I wanted to see. So if we look at the actual microstructures here, to first order, first you can see these alternating layers of mica and actinolite and these quartzo-fastathic zones. These are something called microlithons, which form from this deformation mechanism called pressure solution phase. And this is when you have dissolution of a mineral on the high strain side or high stress side, and then precipitation of that mineral in those lower um, stress sides. And this is a really important deformation mechanism that I think is underappreciated in some areas, but we see evidence for just the formation of these uh, foliations. And then we also see in some of these really quartz-rich lenses that we have evidence for something called dynamic recrystallization, where we have these undulose uh, extinction and these grain boundaries that are wiggly. This is indicative of dislocation creeps being active in the quartz. Okay, so we have some flow laws that can describe the strength of these deformation mechanisms. So we can start to think about how strong this rock was when it was deforming in this way. Um, so I was like, yay, we figured it out. This is great. And then I got <laughs> a bunch of x-ray maps from the microprobe and realized that the story was actually a little bit more complicated than that. So what I'm showing you right here is a stacked set of x-ray maps from the electron microprobe. And what I've done is I've colored the minerals um, in red are aluminum rich minerals, green minerals are magnesium rich minerals, and uh, blue minerals are calcium rich minerals. And so minerals that sort of plot in the middle are minerals that might have some of a couple of these elements. And this just allows us really nicely to look basically at the different phases here, right? And so you can see like a mineral like muscovite or fengite is gonna be really red because it's really rich in, in um, aluminum, right? Um, you can see this mineral in black here. This is quartz, right? because quartz doesn't have any magnesium, aluminum, or calcium in it. And so when I was looking at this optically, I thought all of these fine-grained minerals that are clear and clear plain polarized white and have a low interference tolerant and cross polarized white were quartz. But if you actually look at where the quartz is distributed here, and now I've just sort of pulled the quartz out, you can see that it's not actually really interconnected, and modally there isn't that much quartz. So when we think about rheology, 
we want to think about some minerals that are accommodating deformation. And that usually means that they're interconnected and they're volumetrically dominant, or at least there are uh, <laughs> more than this here. So um, that was unfortunate. We were like, oh gosh, what's happening here? Well, it turns out if you actually look at the albite, right, which is a soda feldspar, you can see that the albite is more locally abundant and it's more interconnected. And you can see that there are lots of these areas where we have fengite grains that are actually pinning these albite grains and making them really small. So we basically decided here, based on these microstructures, that we do have pressure solution creep, but rather than it necessarily being dominant in the quartz, it seems like it's a really important deformation mechanism in the albite. So we did a bunch of electron backscatter diffraction or EDSD work on these rocks to, to try to see if there's evidence for dynamic recrystallization in the albite or in the quartz. And as we saw optically, we see that there are um, misorientations in the quartz, which is really common if you have dislocations moving through your minerals. So that suggests that we have dynamic recrystallization of quartz. And we can see here, it's a little hard to see here maybe, but these are crystallographic preferred orientations or pull figure plots for um, quartz and albite, and actually they're really weak CPOs in all of these, which is something that we would expect if there's a lot of um, diffusion creep or dissolution reprecipitation creep, um, which does not produce a strong crystallographic preferred orientation in these minerals. So this is all to say, these microstructures are directly informing the rheology or the relationship between um, stress and strain rate that we're seeing in this rock. So we can also, with the EDSD, get out grain sizes. And so we see that these grain sizes are about 15 microns in size for both the quartz and the albite. This is important because some deformation mechanisms are sensitive to grain size, meaning if the grain size is small, the rock is going to be really weak. And pressure solution creep is one of those deformation mechanisms. So now I'm going to take just a little bit of time to walk you through some of the rheological modeling that I've done. So I'm going to be showing you some plots of shear stress and log versus shear strain rate. Um, so this is a log log scale. This is done for the PT conditions that this rock was deforming at based on the petrology for the splitted shift. So first, what I'm going to show you are these flow logs for quartz, right? So quartz is one of the best, it is the best uh, characterized crustal mineral in terms of its rheology. We've done lots of deformation experiments on quartz. So we really know the relationship between stress and strain rate, or as well as we know any of these relationships, quartz is one of them. And so this red line here that I'm showing here, this is the flow law for dislocation creep. You can see importantly that it is a, a power law creep right here where we have a stress exponent of four here on stress. Um, and there's also no grain size dependence here. There's no little d, which is sort of the term that we use for grain size. This dashed line here is the flow law for pressure solution creep at these conditions with these grain sizes. And you can see here where stress is, there's no exponent on it. So it is linearly viscous. Um, rheology is what we call it, and it is grain size dependent because we have this D here. And because the D is on the bottom here of this relationship, the smaller the grain size, the weaker this deformation mechanism is going to be. And so we're using a grain size of 15 microns that we have here for quartz, right? But remember, I just brought you through all of that microstructural work, <laughs> and we said, well, quartz is there and it's doing something, but really albite is also really important. So we can actually do the same kinds of plots for albite here. And that's what we're doing right here. So you can see again in, in this solid line, this is the flow law for dislocation creep of feldspar. And you can see it's fairly plots here on our, on our plot. And that's because dislocation creep of feldspar is strong. Feldspar is a strong mineral. It takes higher temperatures than we're seeing here for it to be able to deform by dislocation creep. Um, but you can see this dotted line here. This is the relationship of diffusion creep of feldspar here which is a grain size sensitive deformation mechanism. We don't have a flow law for albite or um, pressure solution creep, but uh, this seems to be pretty good at approximating it. So we can see this here like this, and we can actually calculate this with enhanced diffusion creep. And so this is taking into effect um, the boundaries between those fengite grains that are pinning these albite grains and keeping them quite small. They can be fast pathways for diffusion of fluids and materials. And so those grain boundaries actually can enhance this deformation right here and make it a little bit weaker. We also have some micas in here, right? So we talked a bit about these fengites. Um, we have some uh, flow laws for micas, but they've been done at room temperature. And because micas can uh, weaken, at least we don't really know, 
um, can only deform by basal glide. They don't satisfy von Mises criterion, so they're actually really difficult to fold into our rheological modeling. Um, so we have this scrolla here, but it's really weak, and we actually don't think that it's uh, going to uh, really work at high shear strains. So basically, what we've done is we've taken all of these slow laws and we've combined them together, right? Because a rock is not just made out of quartz or not just made of albite unless you're a quartzite or an albatite. In fact, we have multi-phase aggregates. And so we have taken this phenomenological approach by Handy, um, published in 1994, that allows us to look at and combine the strengths of multiple minerals together um, to calculate the rheology of two-phase aggregates. And so this red line that I'm showing you right here is the strength of the quartz and fengite areas, which remember are volumetrically uh, less dominant than the fengite and quartz areas. And so this dashed line is for the enhanced diffusion creep of albite, and then this solid line is for just the diffusion creep of albite and fengite here. So this makes sense with the microstructures that we are seeing. And what I mean by that is that we're seeing a lot of evidence for diffusion creep in the uh, albite or dissolution precipitation creep in the albite, right? Um, and then there's some evidence for dislocation creep in the quartz. So if we think about typical stresses along the plate interface, this is from Elliot Obamacy's work that other people have done, we know it's in the range of the 10 to the negative five level. So this is sort of their typical stresses that we think are occurring along the plate interface. So using some sort of reasonable thicknesses for these shifts that we might expect along the plate interface, um, we can calculate what kind of um, strain rates we need to accommodate tectonic creeping rates from like a typical plate boundary um, convergence rate. And so you see that at typical creeping strain rates, this intersects with these stresses, these typical stresses along the plate interface really nicely to basically produce what we would expect based on our microstructures, that there's pressure solution creep active here, and then there's some minor dislocation creep in the quartz. However, if we look at slow slip strain rates, we would require stresses of uh, 100 megapascals for dislocation creep and thousands of megapascals to accommodate um, to accommodate slow slip strain rates at um, by pressure solution creep. Uh, we don't have stresses this high on the plate interface, particularly if we're in a um, zone with uh, high flow fluid pressures, which are going to be a relatively low stress area. So this is unreasonable. So what this suggests is that viscous deformation in these shifts is not facilitating slow slip. And in fact, it's just developing during regular tectonic creeping sort of in future slow slip stages um, here. And so uh, my co-author Melody French and I have taken the same approach, not just for these shifts, but also for basically the full range of lithologies that we see along this plate interface here. And we've combined our geologic observations of the microstructures in these rocks with our knowledge as it stands right now of the constitutive relations or these rheological relations for those deformation mechanisms that we observe evidence for in the microstructures. And what falls out of this, what we see is that with this rheological modeling, low at low stresses and low to moderate pore fluid pressures, viscous deformation in the metasedimentary units can accommodate these tectonic uh, creep strain rates. So that's what I just showed you. That's sort of what we see. We see this also is the same thing in the same case in the calc shifts that have you know a bunch of calcite in them as well. Um, and so you can think of this if you think in more circle diagram space. You can think sort of you know at these moderate pore fluid pressures and low stresses where more circles sort of hanging out over here away from this failure envelope. We have a viscous deformation that's taking place. However. At low to very low stresses and at elevated pore fluid pressures, so very high pore fluid pressures, so near um, lithostatic pore fluid pressures, we see activation of frictional deformation mechanisms in um, calc and chlorite shifts at these low stresses. And these can accommodate slow slip strain rates. So if you're, we're in more circle space, you can think of us as sort of getting pushed over here by lowering the effective normal stress here, um, right? And having, you know, intersecting our failure envelope and activating frictional deformation. So what we think we might be seeing with these models is partitioning of deformations within the plate interface as we see exposed in Switzerland between lithologies and is controlled by the variable pore fluid pressures. So that's interesting. One thing that is dependent on this is the occurrence of these talc and chloric rich lithologies. 
because you don't have those lithologies, you won't have these really weak rocks to partition this quick small deposition that you do. Um, so if you look at this cross section right here, um, you're sort of like, well, how do you get calcium chloride rich rocks on this lake interface? You are going to have a bunch of chloride that's going to form these metabasalts. But I just showed you that photograph, right, of the metabasalt, and it didn't have any viscous redevelopment foliation or any kind of foliation at all that was developing, right? It didn't look like it was deforming. But what we do see is around these metabasalts, as the contact with the serpentinite, we see evidence for some talc shift and these really nicely, strongly foliated chloride shifts. So this suggests to us that there's some metasomatic process that's happening um, to produce these shifts that are rich in these biologically important minerals for this close list along these boundaries. And so this sort of inspired some work that my postdoc, Will Hoover, who is well, my postdoc, he's an NSF postdoctoral fellow working with me um, uh, at our lab at UW. And what he is looking at is he's actually targeting in Catalina, where we have rocks exposed at sort of the right PT conditions for where we think we have close within modern subduction zones. He is looking at a lot of these deformed talc shifts and chloride shifts and combining um, lithium isotope diffusion chronometry to get at time scales of fluid flow and metastomatism and potentially deformation and petrology together with a whole bunch of microstructural and structural analysis to try to test the link between metastomatism that might be happening to create these weak rheological phases and then uh, deformation in these rocks to see if there actually could potentially be some of these exposed to here. So um, he'll be presenting some of this work at Goldschmidt this summer, um, and hopefully it'll be coming out soon. Um, so we can then ask the question, where are these fluids sourced, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, where are these fluids sourced? We know in subduction zones, right? This is a fluid-rich zone here. Uh, we have some options here with these shallow core fluid pressures. Um, but we think based on geologic work and experimental work that's been done that they're all sort of expelled from these core spaces at depths of under 15 kilometers. So then we also have metamorphic fluids that can be sourced here, right? Um, and these are fluids that are sourced based on the pressure and temperature conditions that the lab is viewing, right? So the metamorphic reactions that are taking place are the release new, new fluids. Um, stable isotopic data from even these veins that I showed you um, suggest that the fluids that precipitated the, the silica in these veins is sourced from metamorphic um, fluids. Um, so we think that they're metamorphic fluids down in here. So if they're metamorphic fluids, then we need to really think about uh, what the pressure temperature conditions and paths along this plate interface are, because these dehydration reactions are a function of slab top PT paths. And so we can ask the question, you know, were these fluids uh, produced in situ right here, which might have a really important uh, metamorphic mechanism for elevating these core fluid pressures, if you have dehydration events there, or potentially they could be sourced from much deeper, which then requires uptick movement of these fluids along the plate interface, which says something really interesting about the permeability structure of the plate interface. So uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, but basically, what we've done is we've looked in modern subduction zones where we have tremor and slope stuff happening, and where we have um, pretty good uh, geodynamic thermal models of what the plate interface and temperature conditions are. And so we've done this in Mexico, and in Cascadia, and in Mankai in Japan. And we've looked at the occurrence of tremor and slope slip, and we've compared it to where we have metamorphic dehydration reactions of the typical um, of typical subduction zone lithologies along the uh, pressure temperature paths from these geodynamic models within these zones. And then we've compared it to the occurrence of tremor to see if it's occurring at the same depth or if it's occurring at deeper depths and then requires uptick movement. So I've done this in the program for Plex is where I've done most of this modeling. Um, so Plex is a thermodynamic modeling software and it can predict these mineral assemblages and the amount of mineral bound water over large uh, pressure and temperature ranges. And so I'm just showing you an example of this. This is uh, a surface of the amount of mineral bound water, so water that's stuck in the mineral sphere, of an average bore. And you can see the bluer colors are more water. This is the Bluja species area. And the red colors are less water present over here. And so we have pressure here and temperature here. So this is like equidote species over here. And then we can take these PT paths that we get from these geodynamic models, and we can extract the water along these PT paths and see where we're losing water here with this approach. And then the areas of water loss from these rocks 
are basically a proxy for where food is being released into the system that could potentially create this high portion pressure. Okay, so we don't just do this for more. We're doing this for more. Sea floor altered more. It's just more that's been sitting on the sea floor for a while. We do this also with uh, if the food is more mantle that's been dehydrated um, or a cementonite. And then we can also do this for a typical metapellet. And I want to be clear that I'm using fluid saturated conditions in all of these cases, um, which I think is a good approximation for what we think the environment is along, along the fit interface. This is not a good proxy for what's happening deeper in the class, but maybe along the fit interface it is. And then we actually extract this data across um, a plus or minus 50 degree range here just to get sort of over the uncertainty both in our pseudo section modeling and in the thermal model, uh, the geodynamic thermal model. Okay, so here are what the results look like. We have water here on the y-axis. On the uh, x-axis, we have distance uh, or depth here. You can see I've plotted tremor as these histograms here and slow-slip as these um, areas here for Guerrero, Cascadia, um, Jalisco, Colima, and then uh, Shikoku and Q here. And so this is showing us where we have dehydration in the metapellite. The dark line is the path along the actual PC path, and this gray swath is where that plus or minus 50 degree area. So you can see that there's sort of just general continuous dehydration, um, but low level from these metapellites. But when we put on here the altered more, you can see that there are these zones that I've shown in this blue arrow here. And we're releasing, you know, one to one and a half weight percent of water over a very narrow depth range. And you can see that this correlates in some ways, at least, to where we see tremor and slow slip. We see an even stronger relationship when we look at the average more here, we're releasing uh, in Guerrero up to two weight percent water here, the same in Jalisco Colima, and also in Cascadia and in Chicoco. And then if we look at, you know, our depleted morph mantle or what sort of our ultramafic fully hydrated location with rocks would look like, you can see in almost all of these uh, areas, the rocks don't get hot enough for serpentine to break down. Um, except for Jalisco Colima here, um, which is a very hot progression zone. Okay, so this suggests that metamorphic dehydration in mafic rocks, right, can potentially provide in situ fluid for a successful slip and tremor depth. And this is consistent with isotopic studies, as we've been showing, as I showed you. Um, but we can ask the question quickly <laughs> what dehydration reactions actually are releasing this water, right? So can we link this to an actual dehydration reaction? So if we look at Guerrero as our example here, here's the average morb. Um, here's the PC path for Guerrero. Remember, Guerrero has a flat slab right here. Um, so it's like flat in this zone right here. And what I'm showing you here is a mineral box plot. So this is the percent volume of minerals here. And then this is going along that PC path over here in pressure. Um, you can see temperature here. And so each of these colors represents a different mineral that's stable along this PC path. And where it disappears, that's where that mineral is reacting out along that PC path. So we can, you know, zoom along this zone and we can see this is the amount of water that's being lost along here. And so you can see where there are these zones of large water loss here. It also correlates really strongly in Guerrero with the observed distribution of tremor. And so the minerals that are breaking down here, in this case, along this path, um, we can see that we have chlorite breaking down and we're growing epidote, calcium, rich amphibole, um, some garnet, and some anthracite. And we're releasing about two weight percent water at the depths of CS here. So a considerable amount of water here. And I should say that there actually isn't a big change in density across these reactions, which makes uh, the uh, argument for high pore fluid pressures being produced even stronger, right? Because there's not like a big change in density or increase in density that would open up space for these fluids to live in. So we can do that along the cold path and along the warm path. These are just two same things. And you can see here, importantly, along the cold path, we're actually in lost night species, species here for a little bit. And so in this case, we don't just have chlorite breakdown, but we also have lost night breakdown in growth epidote here, that's releasing a bunch of water. But what this tells us is that the breakdown of chlorite and lost night in these mafic rocks, so in the slab near the plate interface, can produce one to three weight percent water um, at the conditions where we see tremor and slow slip and lead to the growth of epidote, amphibole, and garnet. Um, and so I think this answers this question that dehydration reactions along these warm PC paths are able to produce these fluids in situ here, which suggests that potentially these metamorphic reactions could be important in modulating or leading to slow slip events. 
And we can think about which lithologies are actually contributing the most. These are some of these morbs, right? Breakdown of chlorite and breakdown of lawsonite. And so we can ask a whole host of questions, like what are the time scales of this fluid release? Like, could this really be part of what's modulating this epiphytocity, this teaching of tilt and tremor? And are there really enough fluids to create this lithostatic core fluid pressure? And one question that my PhD student Peter and I have been asking is where can we actually find evidence of this in these big rock records? Like this is a model, this model says this could be happening, but who sees it in the rock, right? And so my PhD student Peter Lindquist has been working on this on Catalina again. Um, and what he has found here in some of these rocks in these epidopolutious and epidemicipolis species conditions right here um, is some evidence for some veining in epidotes. So you have these epidote veins that are forming here. Um, and so the hypothesis is that potentially these epidote veins could be these epidote products that are growing in the breakdown of these more hydrous phases like chlorite or lawsonite. And so here's what these look like in thin section. Um, they're really beautiful. And so, you know, he's using trace element stereochemistry and stable isotope diffusion chronometry with Will Hoover to link these to uh, potentially lawsonite and chlorite breakdown and then look at epidotes. He's trying to get at this and see if maybe all this epidote in here is actually because of these big precipitation reactions. Okay, so conclusion. What I think I've shown you is that the plate interface is a really fluid rich environment and it can facilitate both brittle and viscous deformation. But just because you see brittle and viscous deformation doesn't mean that it's necessarily pulseless and doesn't mean that it's necessarily tremor. So we really need to bring in our constitutive relations and our rheological understanding of the strengths of these materials at different strain rates to uh, be able to attribute, you know, pulseless or this tectonic creeping to these. It's really lithologically variable. And I think that's super important because with that lithologic variability, you're going to get rheological variability too, right? And that viscous deformation accommodates tectonic creeping at low core fluid pressures. But if we have elevated high core fluid pressures, we can activate this frictional deformation and accommodate pulseless. And then I also think that, um, you know, we can actually produce a lot of this fluid in situ as a condition of um, PTS and these warm subduction conditions. And then I, I like to, I led with this slide, I like to finish with this slide. Um, this is Cascadia. I live right here in Seattle. There are 12 million people that live along this state boundary, you know, going all the way, you know, from Canada down here into Northern California. Um, and they live along a subduction zone that has tremor and pulseless, and that hasn't had a large mega crust of quake for over 300 years. Um, so there are societally relevant reasons to study these phenomena, to really be able to understand what's happening in them, what might be causing pulseless and tremor, and then can we take what we learn about that and fold it back into this lithology and see what happens. Okay, I'm done. I'd love to answer questions. Thank you. All right, let me do something real quick here. All right, so sorry, I was taking some background of the of the video for the Zoom people so they could see us. Uh, uh, any questions for for Haley? And let's let's start with the questions from the grad students. Hi, Haley. Do you have any time control on any of this stuff? You mean like these reactions? Ah, um, so the rocks from the erosive zone, we don't have any dates of that deformation directly. Um, people have dated Fenzite and nearby chips from the Sixteen Age of Subduction, and from Lithium Geothermal Climate and Dome Region, the rocks haven't been above 20 degrees since subduction. So, um, no, but there's a bunch of toxide in there that I'm actually starting to try to date. Hopefully, we'll have enough camera so we can actually see when we're dating on the appetite. Yeah. Um, uh, I was wondering about so your your field study area you can essentially about 300 hectares, <laughs> but can you sort of like essentially do it more like 450 hectares to get the tool? Mm. Are you just saying this is coming down to the region and that's just like so? Is that right? So 
that's how that, that's how it's still consistent with the entire system. Oh, I can't see this slide. Uh, oh, yeah, I should repeat go the question back to this. Yeah, if you can repeat the question for people on Zoom. Okay, so the question was we can sort of see it on here, right? So in the uh, field area in the erosive zone, we're sort of at conditions like in here. And that the modeling that I've done has suggested that maybe we need to be over here to get these dehydration reactions. Yeah, so the topology here of these mafic rocks and where they do or do not hold water is really important because like one thing that people have already struggled with and said, well, maybe metamorphism doesn't matter is because people have not been able to like identify one single metamorphic reaction that produces this fluid. But I would argue that actually it doesn't, you don't need one single metamorphic reaction to produce this fluid. Any metamorphic reaction that produces fluid will do. So in the erosive zone, when we're sort of right here, we're maybe right at this boundary where we're leaving lawsonite gaseous species and we're moving into epidote gaseous species. And that lawsonite can hold so much water. And that epidote can hold water, but not near as much as the lawsonite. So that reaction there, if the peachy path is moving like that, specifically in that subduction zone, is a place where we could produce that water in situ. Now, maybe it's not, right? I mean, we don't actually know if there was ever slow slip in the erosive zone. I don't think that really matters. Um, I just showed the microsurfaces that I showed you showed that like, if there was slope up there, it's definitely not in those shifts. Um, but there could be fluids that are produced here depending on this PT path. So this is something that my student Peter is also working on is trying to be really, um, trying to do these kinds of models, not in a, a forward modeling way, but in an inverse modeling way to sort of reproduce PT paths that we see preserved in these um, make it rocks on Catalina to see if we can reconstruct that PT path and if we actually are moving out of one of these hydro, more hydro species into more um, water species. This is a great question. Following up on this methodology question, um, have you thought about data and micas or even spot species specific to some kind of micas? I was just looking at the table again, but yeah, it looks like they're saving that. But yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was if we thought about dating the micas and doing spot fusion. Yeah, argon, argon, spot. Yeah, argon, argon spot fusion on the micas. So no, other people have done that. Um, this project has been spinning up a lot more than it was originally, but this started as like a one month post off that I was doing. Um, so no, but I think that would be awesome. It would be really cool to do that. And if you could get appetite data from it too, to see how those two systems, what, they're, what either of them are saying about um, the data. No, I know, I don't think anyone has done any like spot work on the micas there, um, but they have done some argon argon work on things that they have high quality that are like, you know, in kinematics and scales and stuff. Um, but that's maybe some gift that not anything that we've done. Oh, frankly, I'm like not super psyched up on something else. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a great place to work since the rocks are incredible. Um, but I have found that the community has just different opinions about things. And I am more interested in the processes preserving the rocks than um, sort of the tectonic everything there. I mean, like having a tectonic system, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested maybe not because of the process they may or may not preserve. So this is why I'm working in Catalina now. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering if you could say based on the main site, the research for that site, how much time it took? It was a lot of withdrawal from one site to the site to the other site. How long did that take? Yeah. That's, um, that's a great question. I cannot give you an answer. So um, I think that's a very small thing having those shifts. And because those shifts start off as fail, right? So they start off with a really small grain size. They are, you know, deposited at the surface and subducted down here. So they go through prograde metamorphic them as they're, you know, subducting along there. And they're growing that fenzite, that white mica, and they're growing that halite there too. So you have these metamorphic reactions that are happening as this thing is deforming. So they can't grow very wide grain sizes. And if you have um, uh, called, it's a phenomenon called pinning, where you have micas or other phases that are surrounding uh, minerals like quartz or albite that does not allow them to grow these large grain sizes like they would if you had mixed pro grades metamorphic or end up deformation. So it sort of forces the grain sizes to stay small and then you can't readily deform by just a big creep. It just sort of held out of that um, large grain size and you, you just have a 
of like consensus that they need something to not be self specific out there. So I think it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's box two sensor because there are these games in them. Um, is it like the same way that you're doing this? Or is it yeah, so it's, well, we can go look in the more circle diagram. That should be helpful. It's going to be so awful. I'm sorry. So the, the question, find, yeah, yeah the question for the people on Zoom, if I remember it, is, you know, what's the actual like tensile? You're asking what the tensile strength of these rocks are? Yeah, and what is a very simple question is exactly the first thing you made the difference. Yeah, okay, so if we're here and we have differential stresses that are in the 10 to megapascal range, um, right, like, and we're on our Mohr circle diagram, the diameter of that circle, right, is the, is the differential stress, right? And so at these uh, deep depths, right, we're way over here. And then the pore fluid pressure increasing pulls things back here, right? And so as long as our pore fluid pressures aren't so high that we're intersecting this failure envelope or our differential stresses are low enough so our diameter is small, we aren't going to have fractures um, in the rock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is the viscous deformation here. And this is done at pressures of, um, you know, so this pressure here, if we think that our normal stress is our lipostatic stress, right? Or, yeah, because our lipostatic stress is going to be at like, um, you know, 900 MCA. Um, so here, this is basically the diameter of our Mohr circle, but it's not telling us an absolute space where it is in our Mohr circle in terms of the um, intrinsic normal stress. Does that make sense? So this is really just the diameter of our Mohr circle. So if we go back to this, you know, this is sort of the diameter of our Mohr circle here. Um, and so if the diameter of our Mohr circle is here and it has like hydrostatic pore fluid pressures, we're gonna be like way out like at the like at the end there in terms of this, and it's not gonna intersect with this at all. So in order to have this fracturing occur here in these rocks, we really do need to either somehow get really high differential stresses or we need to have high pore fluid pressures to pull us over this way to the effect of normal stress as we would see here. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Mm -hmm. I can talk to you more after. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I'm wondering about the MCL Yeah, so we know this from the geodetic data, um, where we have some constraints on it, although it's not in the news because they're assuming it's on the state interface. Um, uh, they're just measuring this at the surface, right? But these flow slope events are happening over several weeks. Some are happening over several months. Um, so like in Guerrero, I think they're quite long. They happen over like several months every, and actually in Guerrero, you have like a couple of different kinds of episodic. Um, UCS events, some that happen every like, I don't know, X years that are like five years or something that are really long, and then you have shorter ones that are happening more frequently in different places. Um, it's really, it's really wild. Um, I am not a geodesist, but I read those papers and I'm like, oh shoot, we need to like, hold in. It's a long time. So they're happening over that time frame. And, you know, I think over the entire time frame, I don't know how much of this should offsetting. Um, but it's not like we're feeling it surface or anything. Any idea of order of magnitude and millimeters per second or something? I mean, so the strain rate is going to be like 10 to, if we assume a thickness in here, if it was happening, it's going to be like 10 to the minus 10. Yeah. Uh, yeah.
Yeah, go, go ahead. Um, this is about the build up. So I was just wondering, like, do you have So I was just wondering, is there any um, potential for like strain over printing, like as these like subduction channel rocks are like eventually find them themselves in the upper crust? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the question was if there's any overprinting that's happening, like of deformation features and stuff as you enter exhumed. Certainly, and that's something that we always, always struggle with. Um, right? Is that like if we want to reconstruct probate processes, like the processes that are happening during subduction. How do we know that the features you're seeing in the rock are happening at subduction? And so that's a, a great question. You know, there I think in these rocks specifically, there's a good temperature argument where we sort of know that the rocks haven't been warm since they happened. We see the deformation microstructures in there, like the microstructures that we see in the quartz specifically can only happen at like 300 to 350 degrees C. So that suggests that at least, you know, we're preserving that angular distinction and we're, you know, weight and pain boundaries that suggest that they haven't really been overprinted at all. Um, but other areas like people who have worked in the San Franciscan and stuff, there's a ton of overprinting that's been happening during estimation. I mean, we could talk about estimation and everything, but you also need to understand how these trains even move in the first place. Um, so, yeah. yeah. But yes, great question. And like a lot of our legwork goes to like being like, are we actually able to even reconstruct any process that was happening during the production of these rocks? Any more questions? Yes, sorry. Can you pull together a couple of quicker and hard uh, sequence coordinate questions? But I, by my understanding, tremor sort of affirms seem to be harder to burn to occur at the active extent of a particular a little bit. Do you think it had to? is like people have and I can sort of start to answer it as they're repeated. So people have uh like you know geophysicists that have been working on ETS have shown that tremor sort of occurs over a ETS event sort of on the outward side sort of around the margins of where slope has actually migrated in the region. That is like a super interesting and super important observation because I think it rules out some mechanistic like ideas that people in the rock record have suggested. Um, so uh, so the question is, is that potentially like dehydration fronts or something like that? Um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is that's really interesting is that we have ETS happening, but we also have close-up events that don't have fronts that are happening in subduction zones below the Parsons Island zone. 
Um, so is that just based, like, what is ECS? Just like you have some rocks that can break, and so, so they do. And then when you just have full slip without tremor, you just don't have those rocks that can break. Or is there a different mechanism that that's what the flow state needs and one has some mechanism that produces these LFEs to both in shear space and some don't? I don't know. I'm answering your question with more questions than my answers. I don't know, but I think it's a really important observation. And I think it's so fascinating. One thing that I've been thinking, like people, a lot of people want to say that like tremor is, uh, or a lot of rock people at least want to say that tremor is hydrofracturing um, of the, you know, plate energy. So you have these high pore fluid pressures that then are so high that you're able to fracture the rock, right? Uh, that's really interesting. You know, maybe I'm kind of arguing that a little bit here. Um, but if you think about those observations, right, of tremor sort of being around the outside of it, if you fracture your rock, you open up a lot of space there for those fluids to live in. And you can imagine that you would then lower the flow state pressure there. So you wouldn't necessarily have this kind of like a leading edge that then the slope would like migrate into. Um, I've like gone around in my head a lot about this, and I'm doing it right now. <laughs> um, but I think it's a really interesting and good observation, and this is one of the reasons why I think us geologists that are working on this need to be closer to the geological observations because we are looking in the rock record of things that are smoothed out over long time scales. You know, they're not necessarily like hard to, we can start to process what's happening over months and rocks that have been around for, you know, these millions of years. Um, but I think that's an important observation and I'm not answering it, but yeah. More questions? I actually think that the geology can be really helpful in testing if, if what what could be the specificity. I mean, one option that people have suggested is that it's controlled by. Uh, but so sorry, what are people on Zoom? The question was if these kinds of studies can answer something about the epicidicity of the ECS, um, or if that's something that geophysically needs to be answered. So some people have suggested that uh, ECS is actually modulated by pore fluid pressure cycling due to, you know, you have an episode of high pore fluid pressures, you fracture the rock. When you fracture the rock, because you have these high pore fluid pressures, you open up space, the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, you can actually precipitate a lot of material into these veins, like these quartz veins, these fractures that become veins. And then as you precipitate that material into these fractures, um, you're taking up that space so you could sort of jack up the pore fluid pressure again. Interestingly, that does not require delivery of more fluid. You could just have the same fluid there, just sort of like modulating things like that. And some people like John Fisher at Penn State has suggested um, based on silica kinetics, of precipitation that this could happen on sort of the time scale of the inter ECS. Um, now that's dependent on like the fluid being like very salty, which allows silica to precipitate more quickly. And so that's sort of a knob that's very unconstrained that we can just sort of turn that mod model. Um, I think it would be really interesting to use the diffusion chronometry if we can to try to figure out the time scale of these metamorphic reactions, if we can sort of fingerprint them in the field and see if that, if it could really be these metamorphic reactions. I think kinetics are really important there too, and um, I need to think about that way more. But I think the rocks can start to answer some of those questions. Yeah. I have a quick follow up question to that. So, so what do you think the, could um, another way of releasing water rapidly, you know, like, like create like the acidicity be? Um, associated with like slight overstepping of some of these dehydration yeah. reactions. Like you slightly overstep the reaction then like once you trigger it, then you have like a cascading effect once water is released yeah. and then you have, um, you know, a mechanism to release uh, more water rapidly, but at the start. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And Victor and I, I don't think I have them on these plots, but we have entropy plots. Um, yeah, if those plots sort of like, like how likely is this reaction to be overstepped or to be actually in equilibrium. Yeah, like spinning yeah exactly. Like so we have done those and I can't remember, but I remember like chlorate breakdown, uh, you would think does, you know, could be overstepped, but loss might break down, you don't, you think it would sort of happen just right away um, continuously. But I'd have to check that. But I think that's a, 
cool approach, and Victor has sort of talked to me a little bit about that, Victor Guevara. So yeah. yeah, but we should talk more about that. That's yeah. a good question. Any more questions? Not. I have just one more, and um, it's, a, it's about so the like the the pathways of uh, of fluid flow. So yeah. initially, you were. You know, I guess the, you made the connection between the slow clip, um, you know, like trimmer and the lab behavior with a uh, warm compression, right? right? Yeah. Because you essentially need like dehydration reactions to take place in situ at the depth and at the pressure. Yeah. Uh, where they can activate those mechanisms. Um, so in, in colder compression zones, you would have, you know, the dehydration reactions would, um, you know, would, would occur more, um, you know, at deeper levels. Yeah. Initially, you have, you know, you have that pathway, this kind of, Fluids being released deeper and then flowing up kind of yeah. a subduction interface and then potentially feeding the flow, you know, the, the pore, you know, the water at the levels where they can, um, you know, trigger these mechanisms. Do you think that that's not, uh, like, based on the fact that we don't see that behavior in cooler subduction systems, that that um, basically path, pathway for uh, fluid flow does not occur? I what think, happens to the water when it dehydrates? Um, yeah. Well, so that's a great question. And like, I actually think that when the water dehydrates from here, it does move up dip and it just hydrates the stuff that's right up in here. So it reacts it so effectively. That it yeah, so there's sort of like a up. conveyor belt of water that can yeah. stay there. And so that's, I have this idea that maybe these, like, these subduction zones that are longer lived are going to basically be just like they're fully hydrated, right? So the young subduction zone is kind of built up to sort of like, um, what do they call it? Like, just like a thermal storage sort of conveyor belt of water right here and here and these things. Um, I like that hypothesis. And I think one thing that I'm a little nervous about is the idea, well, maybe it's just, you know, because we don't see it happening in the blue shift to SLJ transition up here, maybe that's proving that we need this in these warm subduction zones because we don't have cold percolate here. But the, the problem is rheologically, there may be a pretty big difference with the way these rocks are deforming. Um, and, and so, and the physical properties are going to be different along these different tissue classes with different depths. So I think that, that that could totally be true, but I need to like think about it more. The other thing that's interesting is as you go from a blue shift to an eclogite, as I said, you open up a bunch of grates. And so you wouldn't expect there to be a high pore fluid pressure here. Um, so you could just have that water like live in the live in the eclogite like or like enclosed space. And if you do like volume change across these reactions, um, you don't you still have more space here. For fluids and are produced by these reactions, which there's a lot of space that opens up here. Yeah. Which is just a lot denser than blue shifts. Yeah. And I guess at, at some point, those fluids have to leave the slab, right? And then just go to the mantle layer. Yeah. And that's uh, you know, what the, whatever remains then in the slab gets probably just reacted back into. Back into like into whatever could be stable, what hydrostates could be stable there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess in the interest of time, let's uh, thank Kaylee again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so here, yeah, I guess it's not working. I think people were, were shy. See you in a bit. <laughs>